May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. In the other Gospels, Mary comes with other women. In seminary, I and part of my class memorized and performed the Gospel of Mark, and I was one of the myrrh-bearing women. They come just when there is enough light to see and walk together, because finally the Sabbath is over, and now they can work. They can take up the body of their Lord, their beloved Jesus, and prepare him to be buried. But in John's Gospel, in the story we hear tonight, Mary comes alone. And I imagine her walking from her home. Her heart is heavy. She can hear the first noises of the city coming awake and the first birds. She draws her garments close around her in the morning cold and wipes her eyes and takes a deep breath. She prepares herself to see the tomb of someone she loved and someone she followed. But when she gets there, the tomb door is open. Jesus' resting place has been disturbed. After all that has happened in the past three days, it must have seemed like just one more strange and unbearable loss. Now what comes next is a great deal of running around and shouting. Mary runs for help, and Peter and the beloved disciple, possibly John, they race one another to the tomb. There's a pile of grave clothes. The two men gather their nerve. I imagine they're kind of daring each other to go inside. There is a lot of seeing and believing, although it's not clear in that moment exactly what they actually believe. It says they did not know yet that the scriptures had been fulfilled, that he would be raised from the dead. Something happened. Finally, the two men returned to their homes. Maybe half an hour or an hour has passed, not long. It's still early in the morning. And here we are with Mary, alone again outside the tomb, still weeping at the loss of her Lord, even the sight of these gleaming and white-robed angels in the tomb, they cannot shake her from her grief. She begs them, as if they were security guards, to tell her where they've taken his body. She has prepared herself to do hard and holy work to bury her friend. In this moment, that's all she can think of. All she wants to do is finish this task and to make it end. And then a voice speaks. It asks the same questions the angels had asked her. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She gives a similar answer. I need to see the body of my Lord. I will tell you that stacks of commentary have been written down through the centuries about this very moment. When Mary mistakes Jesus for a gardener, I arrived today, and our gardeners were still outside. There were piles of weeds and brush, and I thought, oh, how timely. <laughs> Jesus mistakes. Mary mistakes Jesus for a gardener like that, maybe a day laborer, someone up early to complete their work before the heat of the day. Who knew what? Who knew what, when? What does this mean for the nature of God and humanity and whether or not God can experience humanity? Entire systematic theological libraries have been read or written. I've not read them all. We are not going there tonight. 
What is true in this moment is that both of them have come through a great ordeal. Jesus, God's self poured into humanity, has been arrested and tried and beaten and crucified. Christ, the source of the universe itself, died and was buried as all humans are. Also, Mary has watched helplessly its own torment to be so helpless as all she believed in and hoped for was brought to an end. So much suffering and so much grief and so much love. If you've ever lost a loved one, you know that grief shapes and changes you. The greater the love, the greater the grief. It muddles your senses and dulls your responses and clouds your memory until sometimes you can hardly think or hear, certainly not respond with a clear mind. Also, you cannot rush grief. Even if the world wants us to get over it or get back to normal, we know that everything has changed because we loved. <clears throat> so I'm not actually surprised, whatever the theologians make of it, that in that moment Jesus and Mary might not have quite recognized one another. Mary all wrapped up against the cold and pale, Jesus with a bruised face. His familiar garments gambled away, his voice hoarse from crying out on the cross. And yet they do recognize one another. Even as they question and respond, recognition does come to them. Imagine the recognition of an old friend, reunited after a long absence, or if you haven't seen each other during summer break or when your child returns from college, taller and with a pierced nose. <laughs> a loved one waking up from surgery or anesthesia, a prisoner being let, met by a loved one after years in jail, all changed and yet still seen and known and loved. Jesus says her name, Mary. Jesus only says four names in the Gospel of John, and this is one of them. And Mary cries out, Teacher. This is the moment the resurrection becomes wholly real. The moment it moves beyond faith into flesh. The moment we can almost touch it. Here, as in the beginning of creation, here once again in a garden where God walks, and calls out to humanity, and calls us each by name. In the resurrection, God calls us. Calls us in the midst of all that is broken and dying in our own lives into new life. Calls us like the children of Israel in that Exodus story we just heard to walk away from all the comforts and certainties that hold us captive through a wilderness of unknowing, but into freedom. Calls us, like those bones in Ezekiel, to embrace the messiness of human life, to be connected to one another, and to take action. Calls us to remember our baptism, to remember that we are born again, to remember that we are God's calls us even in the midst of grief and loss into love, into change, into a full and resurrected life. Jesus called Mary Magdalene by name. In that moment, she recognizes Jesus in a new way and is herself transformed. She becomes the first witness to the resurrection she returns and tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord. The word in Greek here for tell is angelousa, the word bringer, the one who declares, 
the one who proclaims, Mary becomes like the angels who sang at Christ's birth. She becomes a very messenger from God, sent out with a transforming message, I have seen the Lord, Christ is risen, Alleluia, the message of Easter. Resurrection changed Jesus. Encountering Christ's resurrection changed Mary. Resurrection can and should change us. We may not always be ready to recognize when God comes to us. So much can stand in the way of hearing and seeing, work and study, extracurriculars, stress, illness, grief. There are many things we value and even things we love that can distract us or keep us from hearing. In the midst of all so much feeling from the world, so much content or so much not feeling, in the midst of too much life or too little love, sometimes we don't recognize where resurrection is coming in our own life. But into these moments, God still comes, ready or not. Comes when we least expect it, comes transforming, comes calling our name. From the beginning, from that first garden of creation, and from the garden outside the empty tomb, to all and each of us here and now, God calls calls us to resurrection, calls us to witness, and calls us to tell. Christ is risen, calling us to become messengers like Mary, to run and tell everyone, I have seen the Lord. Amen.